Yesterday we stopped at the consideration of the covenant that God made with Abram in Genesis chapter 15. How that Abram had a concern and his concern was about his posterity. The fact that he had no child, he had no heir. And God said to him, he will have someone that was his own blood. And God then promised him the land. And Abraham said, how am I going to know that I will inherit this land? Uh, God's answer for, to Abraham was a couple of items, animals, that God said Abraham should arrange. And we looked at all of that. How that the way that God wanted to impress it upon Abraham, that he was going to make good his word was that God simply cut a covenant with Abraham. We saw that in that covenant that God cut with Abraham, much to our, if you like, positive dismay, it was God that did what you would have expected Abraham to do. And then to make it even more jarring, it was only God that did it. That is to say, it was only God that walked between the bodies of the animals that had been caught. So God was not holding Abraham. God was simply saying, I will do my part, and basically, I will do your part. And in the New Testament, the way that God comes along to ensure that both ends of that bargain are maintained is, number one, by the atonement, and then number two, by the indwelling, enabling power of his spirit so that we are now able to, to do, all right? God works in us so that we are able to will and then we are able to do of his good pleasure. This is why it is such a humbling thought in the first place that at the end of time, God has also ordained to give us reward. So God is going to reward us for doing things that we did by the grace that he gave to us. That the major part you play in all of it is a willingness. If you are willing and obedient, or as the songwriter says, is to trust and obey. Because the resources you need in order to do the things that truly please God, they are foreign to you. They are alien to you. Those resources are not native to man. It means that it's almost as if Somebody gave you money to go and make some purchases and then when you made those purchases and you brought them home, the person now paid you in order to receive them. Do you understand? Do you understand? Somebody gave you money to go, to go make some purchase and then you went and bought some items. When you brought those items back to give to the person, the person, the person again now gives you money for the items you have brought, items that you bought with money that came from him originally. So that, like, the greatest thing that you bring to the table is a willingness. It's just a willingness. The truth of the matter is, like uh, the old prophet said, all our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. In fact, anything that you did in the energy of flesh cannot be acceptable to God. Because God is not an austere master. He is not a wicked man that seeks to reap where he has not sown. He does not seek to gather where he has not scattered. What that servant said is a lie. God will not seek to gather from where he has not scattered. He will not seek to reap from where he has not sown. Everything that we do for God that counts is possible only because God gave us enablement and it counts only because it was done in the enablement that God alone gives. So this is why I said that God did not only promise to do his own part, he also promised to help Abraham and by extension the seed of Abraham to do their part also. Now, if this is, if there's, if this is not how to rig a situation in a man's favor, I don't know what rigging means. This is divine rigging. God simply rigged the system. <laughs> he rigged it in our favor. Hello? 
Hello? It is like when God has said, Satan, no matter what you do, me and these people, we are going to live together forever. Then Satan will bring all these technicalities, but you have laws, there are rules. You know, they have broken your rule. God said, don't worry. We will satisfy justice. Hello? Hello? We will satisfy justice and mercy will triumph. So when you look at I really need to, this wasn't part of my script, but I need to show you something about God that we miss sometimes. You know, in, in Exodus chapter 33, when Moses was asking the Lord, show me your glory, show me your glory, and you would have imagined that with everything that had happened between God and Moses, there was sufficient ground for Moses to be confident in his knowledge of God. And, but then Moses begins to ask the Lord for a visitation, for an encounter. And then God said, well, you are not going to be able to leave if you see my face. I'm sure you know the story. Now, when um, Moses insisted, the Lord said to him in verse 20, and he said, you cannot see my face for there shall no man see me and leave. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in, in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Hallelujah. Then, when God was going to fulfill it, when God was going to fulfill this promise, of revealing himself to Moses in this supernormal dimension. In the next chapter, the Bible says from about the fifth verse of chapter 34 that the Lord descended in the cloud. Have we done cloud technologies? Have we done it? Okay, if we we'll leave the matter until you, you clear your confusion. You, because you seem to be confused. Anyway, and the Lord descended in the cloud. The Lord descended in the cloud because, well, and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So I want you to, to see the proclamation. This proclamation is what? What is about to be proclaimed now? Talk to me if there's life in your lungs. The name of the Lord. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. I mean, you guys have been here for a bit. You know, I don't ask three questions. So if I ask you a question, the answer is the answer you think is the answer. Most times. All right? And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. So this is a proclamation. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful. This is the name of the Lord that is being proclaimed. The Lord. The Lord God. Merciful. And gracious. Because mercy always comes before grace. Logically speaking. It is because of God's mercy that we enjoy God's grace. That's why it says we come with boldness to the throne of grace. But it is that we might obtain what? Mercy. It is because we obtain mercy that we can find grace. Mercy in another conception is the Generous disposition of God by which God takes away from you what you deserve. And grace is the disposition by which he gives to you what you do not deserve. All right? So you are culpable before a just and a holy God. God takes away your culpability by his mercy and then he grants you his righteousness. By his grace. So grace gives to you that which you do not deserve. Mercy takes away from you that which you deserve. So it is because of the mercy of God that we enter into the full bloom of the grace of God. But of course, God's grace and God's mercy, you know, like many of these biblical concepts, they are very, very interrelated. And um, so oftentimes... We use them synonymously. But when God was ready to introduce himself, and this is very important because when Jesus was asking in the New Testament to his disciples, who do men say that I am? 
Hello? And they told him. And then he said, you, who do you say that I am? And they told him. Peter spoke and he said, well, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. And he goes on to say, you are Peter and all of that. There are very few times that you see God introducing himself. If you want to know God, there is no better person to introduce God to you than God. And we have a rare moment of revelation here where God is proclaiming by himself his name. Are you with me? God is the one introducing himself to Moses. He proclaimed the name of God. So, how, and of course, today is not the day because we are looking at the covenant of blood. We don't have the time to look at the implication of a name as far as scripture is concerned. Yesterday in my meditation, I was looking at the whole baptismal formula that we have in the New Testament and how that there's been a bit of confusion here and there and denominations have debated certain aspects of the baptismal formula for millennia. And what is it? It is because Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 says, this is the way you baptize, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then he looked as if in the practice of the apostolic church in Acts of the Apostles, he now looked as if people were baptized in the name of the Lord. Hello? Almost as if you wouldn't find where people were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that the modalist, you know modalism? All right. A few yes us. Okay, that's why you should go for MCI. Now, so the modalist, the modalist are those that believe that the Trinity is not three persons in one, but it is three manifestations of one person. It's modalism. So when they use, so it's a mode of manifestation. That's where it comes from, modalism. So when you use analogies like this, like water, it can be liquid, it can be solid, it can be gas. That's not the Trinity. That's not, that's not an ideal model for the Trinity. That's modalism. Or they say it's like me now. My name is Gideon. To Hasana, I am husband. To Duke, I am daddy. To James, I am son. All right? My daddy is alive. I have a wife. I have a child. And to each of these persons, I'm different things, isn't it? But I'm the same person, right? That is not the Trinity. The Trinity is not, a, a, is not wardrobe change. All right? Uh-huh. The Trinity is not God trying to mimic a traditional marriage in my village. When they do traditional marriage, the lady will come first with one attire. She will come and greet. After greeting, all is poverty, all of it, this is just money they are looking for. As she comes, see? Then... You will greet. When she comes to greet you, she kneels down there. She cannot leave until you drop something. She will go to the next person. After doing all of that, then they will now follow her back inside. By the time she's coming back the next time, she's wearing a different attire. So in one evening, for one ceremony, she will use like three different, and then the last one that she will now use, that she will come and sit down. In fact, before she will sit down on the mat, ah, they say her waist, her waist cannot, they, you need to buy oil. You, they need to lubricate her. All of it is money. In fact, sometimes people go into debt anticipating to pay with all the Ujuro money that they will make from that ceremony. Now, God is not like the bride in my village's traditional marriage ceremony that in the Old Testament, when he wore one Agbada and he came out, they say, Hey, Father! Then later on, he went back and changed his agbada. And then he wore another linen cloth and came and they say, Jesus. Then he went back and then wore, huh? He now came with the fire. And then they say, Holy Ghost, fire. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> Hello? At the waters of Jesus' baptism, Jesus was on the earth being baptized by John in the waters of Jordan. The Holy Spirit descended. And then the Father spoke from heaven. All three persons acting at the same time. So it's not one person 
showing up in three different modes. There are three persons that are essentially one. And the model has been there from ancient times. The allusions are all over the Old Testament. When you see the seraphim standing before the Lord, and they are saying, holy, holy, holy. Has he ever occurred to you why the holy was not one and why it was not four? Why was it three? Because soon as they had done saying, holy, 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 is, not are, is, then the same Lord now said, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? It's a plurality in unity. The same God said, whom shall I send? And who shall go for us? And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? You can see the singularity and the plurality, isn't it? So the Trinity is not even a New Testament initiative. But I got into all of these things trying to talk to you about my contemplations, about the name, the name, the import of a name. A name in the biblical sense of the word is not just a handle for identification. It's not. A name is more than how you distinguish one person from another. It's not just a label that helps us to be able to refer to someone. That's why Jesus says to pray in my name. Hello? And, and it, it's not just praying in my name includes mentioning the name of Jesus, but not exclusively. You can pray in the name of Jesus without mentioning the name of Jesus. I hope you know. I hope you know. You know, um, I can't remember where it was. Okay, I remember now. But it was, that was a few years ago. It was a conference and, you know, there were a lot of deliverance things that happened. And at the end, somebody, one of the persons, if I remember well, that went with me also was asking why I did some of the things I did the way I did. You see, there's a tendency many times for, if, if you are doing deliverance, for you to think that it is by the multitude of the Jesus that you shout that deliverance will happen. It's not true. Like, manifestly not true. When you look, you remember that those guys in scripture, the sons of Sceva, you know how they had approached their own. They said, in the name of Jesus, we are Jordi. They said, in the name of Jesus. And because in those days, Yeshua, that name was a little bit common. It's the same name as Joshua. Hello? Joshua and Jesus is the same name in the Hebrew. It's not different. So it's a name that people had. So to avoid confusion, the sons of Sceva said, in the name of Jesus, and just in case you are confused, demon, it is the one, that Jesus that Paul used to preach about. You can't be more specific than that. So in case you think we are trying to cast you out in the name of our neighbor, that stubborn boy in the next compound, it's not that Jesus. We are talking of the one that Paul used to preach about. No matter how specific they tried to be, they were the ones that were cast out. Well, the demon cast them out. And there were seven of them. Huh? A demon cast out seven hefty young men. Sons, and their father was a Jew. They were the children of the reverend. Because their dad was... Oh, didn't you read... Hello? Go and check your scripture now. Their dad was a clergy. There were seven sons of one skiver, a Jew and chief of the priest. Is that a small man? Uh-uh. <laughs> uh, it was his sons that were trying to exorcise. They called the name of Jesus and they specified which Jesus they were talking to avoid confusion. They think did not work. But the question that that person was asking me was how I was doing the deliverance without too many mention of the name of Jesus. Get out. Because the name of Jesus is a locale in the spirit. Name is an authority. Onoma. It, it denotes authority. When you do something in somebody's authority as licensed by another, that's what it means. So you, you, it's just as if to say, I didn't come here in my name. 
Do you know what that means? I did not come here in my name. Hello? So, if, if you had an event and you had somebody that you invited and then the person maybe sent another person to represent him, huh? if you have sense, the person that came to represent the person you invited, you will keep them where you would have kept the person that you actually invited. Because this person that has come has come in the name. He has come under the authority of the man that you actually invited. That's why Jesus says, if anyone receives you, he receives me. And he that receives me, receives he that sent me. That's how it works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if I send somebody to your fellowship or ministry to come and preach, and you say, oh, he didn't come, and you treat them anyhow, you will hear from God. <laughs> because if you reject me, you reject the one that sent me. Hallelujah. So a name is not just a label for identification. It's not. It is a revealer, a revealer of the essence of the one that is named. It's many things. A name, it connotes the attribute of the person or the thing and its intrinsic possibilities and authority and even more. So when Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then it looked like the apostles were only baptizing them in the name of the Lord. Some persons have gone off from there to say, the apostles never baptized anybody in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As if, if they didn't mention the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, then they didn't baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Are you getting my point? You do not actually need to mention the name in order to function by the name and under the name. If somebody is demon-possessed and I want to cast the demon out, I will say, hey, you foul spirit, get out! That, the, the demon know where I'm talking from. And me, I know where I'm talking from. If I'm not talking from the right place, even if I say, in the name of Jesus, and then I qualify him, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the everlasting father, the book bonisher of, you know, just call it. Call, huh? call his name in, in Hebrew. Call it in Greek. Call it in Latin. Then add your village people's transliteration of the name. You can spend 10 minutes just calling his name before you now say, in this name, come out. <laughs> if you are not in the name, that name will not work. Are you there? Are you there? It will not work. So, doing something in, okay, Paul said to the Colossians, he says, whatever you do, huh? he says you should do all things in the name of the Lord. <laughs> so, does it mean that Paul is saying that everything you are going to do should be mentioned in the name of the Lord? I sit down in the name of the Lord. I stand up in the name of the Lord. I step up in the name <laughs> of the Lord. When Paul said you should do all things in the name of the Lord, of the Lord. Did he say you should do all things mentioning the name of the Lord? Is that what he means? Talk to me, obviously. No. So, so when I saw God introducing his name here, I just remembered my meditations yesterday. But yesterday's one was on our, around the baptismal formula of the New Testament. And um, how that how that? Matthew 28. Was Jesus talking to the people that we perform the baptism, the baptismal services? And Acts of the Apostles, in Acts of the Apostles, you saw the apostles talking to the people to be baptized. Hello? Hello? So it's like there's instruction given to those that will be baptized as and then there is instruction given to those that are baptismal candidates. 
Hello? Okay, don't worry. Well, you know, we'll soon start our foundation. So when we do of the doctrine of baptisms, we'll now treat baptisms. And you will see that every baptism happens under the authority of a person. You are always baptized into, into. And it happens under the authority. That is what it means to baptize in the name. And then we re, with regards to the proclamatory, uh, uh, the proclamatory aspect of it, you can't even go from Acts of the Apostles to say they never baptized anybody in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because Matthew 28 was to those that we baptize people. Acts of the Apostles was always to those to be baptized. So how do you know that when they told people to be baptized in the name of the Lord, how do you know that when they now came to baptize them, they didn't say, we are baptizing you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Okay, if you don't get it, don't worry. Where are we? Exodus chapter 34. God proclaiming his name. And he says, the Lord, the Lord God. What? Merciful and gracious. So this is the name of God. This is the name of the Lord. According to God. And I'm going somewhere with all of this, my drama. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Let's go on. Keeping mercy for how many? Thousands. Depending on your translation, but the point will eventually be the same. The way the, this verse 7 is rendered is very, very interesting in different translations. But the idea is the same. And it's the idea of proportion. That's where I'm going. I'm trying to show you something about God so that you might have confidence in the one to whom you have fled for refuge. He, he, the Bible says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth, what? Generation. Verse 8. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. So, in, this, in these verses, uh, from verse 6 to uh, verse, eight, uh, verse 7, you see God introducing God. God proclaiming his own name. And in verse 7, particularly, the Bible says that God keeps mercy for thousands. But how did the verse end? He ended by saying that, that this God, he visits iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and unto the third and the fourth generation. So when it came to the issue of his justice and how he visits huh, the transgression, the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, he does that to the fourth generation at the most. But when it comes to his mercies, how long does he keep it? He keeps his mercy for what? For thousands. When it comes to visiting iniquity, so how long? To the third. Huh? But even a, even a wicked were well. They can move it to the fourth generation. Let me see it from ESV, verse 7. ESV, verse 7. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and to the fourth generation? Um, any other translation? Give me some other translation. HCSB. Maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations. Forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin. 
but he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's wrongdoing on the children and grandchildren to the third and to the fourth generation. I was looking for this because I wanted you to see that the thousand is a reference to generations also. Are you with me? Are you with me? So you have, you have generational disposition from God. And then it looked like when it comes to mercy, he, his generational disposition is to what? Thousands. He maintains his faithful love to a thousand generation. You do not know you do not know the glorious blessedness of knowing Jesus, the transgenerational implication of being planted and rooted in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you can, I mean, look at what, when God came to, to David, the thing that David found with the Lord, when David found mercy with the Lord, God said to David, you know what? In the days to come, no matter what happens, you will not fail to have somebody that will sit upon the throne and even if your descendants misbehave, I will deal with them. But my mercy and my love, it will never depart. So after, uh, after Solomon died, and Rehoboam became king, remember the rebellion of uh, the, the, the absurdity of Rehoboam. God was going to split the kingdom. Ordinarily, if there was nothing in that guy's background, they would have thrown him out. But because of what God has said to David, huh? they split the kingdom, they took 10 away and gave it to Jeroboam. But they had to leave two. Let it not be said that the descendant of David is no more king. And it didn't end there. All the way now into the New Testament, you now hear people say, Jesus Son of David. He keeps mercy for a thousand generations. Almost as if to say, God is reluctant to punish. Are you there? But he's excited to show mercy. But many of us think it's the opposite. A lot of people think that, hey, God is waiting for you to do the slightest thing so that his mattock can drop on your head. And then when you now come and beg for mercy, hi, you now say, oh, oh. If I don't show mercy now, it will now look as if, hi. Okay, okay, okay. I forgive you. Because that is how we are as human beings. As human beings, we are more motivated when we are on a quest for justice than we are when there is a demand for us to show mercy. When, when we are on a quest for justice, you, you start hearing things like, no, 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 let's, for once, let's do the right thing in this country, for once. Can't we do the right thing? For once, you will see, all oh, your Queen's English will come out. Oh, every, he. When somebody is not saying, please forgive, you say, I've heard, I've heard, ah, uh -uh. Don't, don't nag you. You're asking for forgiveness. I say nagging. I've heard you. Give me time to think about it. But when they bash your car, if they say, how much does it cost to fix it? You say, let me call my mechanic. You don't need time. <laughs> you don't need time to think about what it will cost for the person that has offended to pay. But if it's time to forgive, even after I have said I've forgiven you, you know that it can actually take you three months to fully enter into the state. Ah, you wake up every morning. You say, man. So I just let that guy go like that. <laughs> Is he paying you? Because the money you used to fix that car that he bashed. Hello? Huh? That money that you used to fix the car that he passed, you, it, that was the money you were planning to use for your Christmas dress. Now it has gone into a inside mirror. 
So for three months, if every time you're driving that car, when you look into the mirror, you say, Nada mirror be this. <laughs> Nada mirror be this. Something will see come in your heart, then you now say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Because we are more eager to exact justice and judgment than we are to show mercy, we project ourselves onto the image of God that we hold. But you cannot be more Catholic than the Pope. You can't know God more than God. This is God introducing himself. And he said, I keep mercy for a thousand generations. And I punish iniquity. Three generations and ah, let us make it for just in case he's outrageous to the third and to the fourth generation. But when it came to mercy, it's to how many generations? Thousand. thousand. Hello? I want you to know that me, I believe that my posterity will know Jesus, we serve Jesus, we love him until Jesus comes. You know why? God's mercy is for a thousand generations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but this thing is very liberating. It's part of the reason why I am very, 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 very excited inside of my belly to be a follower of Jesus. There is, you, hello, no matter what your president is doing and what the dollar is doing and what the Naira is doing, notwithstanding, Sunday school song, I have joy down in my heart, deep, deep down in my heart. And they said, Jesus gave it to me, and nothing can destroy it. And I want to ask you again this morning, do you know that joy? Do you know that joy? Is that kind of thing that made Paul in prison to be telling people that are outside, rejoice. And again, I say to you, rejoice. I said, this man is a very impossible man. Rejoice. Who should be telling who to rejoice? The man in jail is exhorting the people that are free out there. He's the one telling them to rejoice. He says, because I'm a prisoner of Christ. And even though I am in bonds, the gospel of our Lord is not in chains. There is something that this world cannot give and therefore they, it cannot take. Have you found it? And part of my goal this weekend is by the mercies of God to help you to be established in this present truth. That we are connected to a God that delights. God looks for every opportunity. That's the posture of the father in the story of the two prodigal sons. Those boys, you, you saw how that the, 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 the boy was coming from afar. The father saw him from afar. And it wasn't like it was yesterday the boy left home. It was not as if he left home last month. That guy had left home a long time to have spent all of the inheritance that he got and monetized and then to start experimenting with different odd jobs and odd jobs. So I can tell you that that guy did not come back home in the same calendar year that he left home. Yet, the father's eyes were on the way. Waiting for the day that there will be the slightest sign on the horizon. And as soon as he saw, the Bible said from afar off, the father ran literally to the edge of the village and brought his boy through all the way back home. The boy was walking home. The father was running to meet him. That is the God that I'm talking about. Do you, do you know him? Do you know him? 
And I need you to know that this is not a father that is waiting for an envoy that he sent out. You know, when you send somebody on an errand and you're expecting them to come back, it's okay that you can be in anticipation. This is a father anticipating the return of an embarrassment. And I mean, the boy that the father is anticipating his return is a shame. A parable, a byword in Israel. But the father was anticipating his coming home. And the day he saw the slightest sign of it, he ran after him. The love that the father showed to the boy was so outrageous that the speech that the boy rehearsed in a far country, the boy could not finish the speech. He couldn't say everything he had said he would say. When he was still in the far country, he said, I will go home and I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. When he saw the love of his father, he couldn't say, make me as one of your hired servants. He said, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But what I will be called after now, that is for you to decide because I don't understand what is going on here. He could not bring himself to say, make me as one of your hired servants. Even though that's what he had said, he would say when he went home. Because he wasn't planning, he didn't even want to put the burden of being considered a son upon his father. He knew, you know, there are certain requests you shouldn't make of people. I hope you know. It's like how, if, if you are a diligent son, a diligent child, there are some times that when you see the things that your parents are going through, you will have needs that you will not want to tell them because we feel it will be inconsiderate to put the burden of that, of the knowledge of the need on them. So the boy was trying to help his father by saying, I'm coming, but I don't even want you to think that I want you to consider me as a child anymore. That was when he was in the far country. This was his own objective analysis of the situation between him and his dad. So he said, all I'm looking for is just a means of survival. Make me one of your hired servants because my current state is worse than the state of your servant. I know sonship is no longer in the picture, but at least let me be better than this. And your servants are better than this. So since I've lost sonship, can I serve? Can I just be a servant? This was the mathematics in his head when he left the far country. But when he saw the love of his father, he couldn't say it. I need you to know that God is not looking for an opportunity to throw you away. He's not looking for an opportunity to hack you down. He's not looking for an opportunity to disown you. Are you with me? Are you with me? The thing between you and Jesus, more than anyone else, Jesus wants it to work. And maybe one of the things you need to do this weekend he just to try to up, up, up your, your, your consideration and your value for the mercy and the love of God. If there's something God is eager to do, his love, his mercy, if there's something God is reluctant to do, his punishment, his judgment. He's so, he's so reluctant to do it that people now take his reluctance to mean he does not care. That's what Peter tells us. That people will consider the patience of God to be slackness. Jesus said the same thing in, 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 in Revelation. In one of the churches. He was talking about the woman. And he said, I gave her space to repent. In Ezekiel 11. He's crying out. He said, why will you perish? Come back to me, Israel, please. God is literally begging them. Come back to me. The last thing I want to do is to punish you.
And this is revealed to us in the very name of God. This is the kind of God that we serve. This is a God that we have. Such God is ours. Some of us have projected our image of our earthly fathers and the father figures in our lives unto God. But please, hear from his lips. This is God. Introducing God by proclamation. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Imagine. God said all those beautiful things and wonderful things that we want to hear and said, let it not be said that this is not all. I'm also a just God. I will by no means clear the guilty. Hello? So, if God is merciful and will not clear the guilty, how will those things work? <laughs> Because mercy will mean you will clear the guilty. If somebody is not guilty, how do you show them mercy? He said, I'm merciful. And at the same time, I will not clear the guilty. That was why he died. That's why he died. He died so that it will be the case that he punishes guilt. And he died. So that having punished guilt, he will now be able to show mercy. And I want to dare you, whether you are in this hall or you are online or you are listening afterwards, show me a God like this one anywhere else. I don't care the name of your religion. Show me a God like this. It is the question of eternity when Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? When Jesus said, will you also go? Are you here? You are still here? Everybody else is gone. Won't you go like them? Peter asked the question that I think is the question of eternity. To whom shall we go? Everything Anything before Jesus huh? is nothing. And everything other than Jesus is nothing. Before you met Jesus, you had no hope. You were without God in this world. And if you have met Jesus and you turned your back on Jesus, I want you to know that there is no better neighbor anywhere else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the person of God, the person of God, identified in the name of God that God made manifest to Moses, in that name, when, you know, when God said, proclaiming his name, when God started proclaiming his name, we have an idea into the nature of his person especially with his dealings, with his creation. He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. He's abundant. He's long-suffering and abundant in goodness. He keeps mercy for a thousand generations. And on and on. Now, when this God, this kind of God, when this kind of God comes to a man and says, I want to do something with you, he does not need to make a covenant. When you go into the book of Hebrews, you see the, the writer of Hebrews trying to wrestle with the idea of how God enforces or of how God impresses or of how God assures human beings of his fidelity and of his integrity. 
So you read things like, by two immutable things, wherein it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. Because there was nothing else by which God could swear. So he had to swear by himself. Hello? Like, how do I make you know that this is for real? How do I make you know that I'm not going to change my mind? There's nothing higher than God. God cannot say, I swear by God. Who is there that God will lift his hand to? Nobody else. So eventually he had to swear by himself. But when he came to our father Abraham, he did the unthinkable. And the unthinkable was the fact that he walked between the bodies of the animals that had been caught to assure Abraham, I will keep my end of this bargain and if I don't, let me die. You can imagine how uneasy it would have been for Abraham to sleep for the next couple of nights. Because this practice is a practice that he is very conversant with. It, it, he was talking to Abraham in the context of Abraham. This is, you know, those days, people's words were their bonds. It's not like today. If you watch some of those, you know, epic movies and all of that, and you see the way that people, you, you see their value for their word. Like I, I, I took an oath that I will stand by his majesty. And people will go with him even to death. You remember, you, you know those kinds of. So this would make a more serious impression on Abraham than I might ever be able to impress upon you by preaching because our context is very different. But this was something unthinkable. Number one, that God will walk through those animals at all. And number two, that only God did so. You will be surprised almost to the point of trauma. Like, how? Like, is God saying, like, the superlative is too much. God is saying, I will die first before what I've said to you does not come to pass. I will rather die. Uh-uh. He said, it is easier for me to die than for these things to not come to pass. Hallelujah. Now you can understand why Galatians 3 was framed the way it was framed. That the law that came 430 years after cannot disannul this promise that was made to Abraham and ratified by a covenant. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, when God now came, when God now came after Abraham, uh, God came to make a promise, a covenant to Moses and by extension with Israel so that we can get into the blood component of things. The Bible says, in Genesis chapter, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Okay, let's get into the blood component of things. Uh, let's read Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. From verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 11. Um, I just realized I'm running out of time. So let's run. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption 
for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and of the and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new testament or the new covenant covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression transgressions that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance so you see that in this verse 15 there's what is called the first testament are you there and there's what is called the new testament the first testament is the covenant under Moses and the new testament is what Jesus Christ brought. That's part of why the phrasing is Old Testament, New Testament, right? And the Bible says he has become the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So, you notice here that it is the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus is applicable across the testaments. I need to make that point very quickly before we go on. Okay? Because this, I want to make this as basic as possible. The implication is that nobody ever makes it to God behind Jesus. It doesn't matter the testament under which you lived. What, when I say behind Jesus means without the impute of Jesus in your life, you can never appear before God in good standing. Including people that lived and died before Jesus came into the world. The Bible says, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. So there were transgressions that were under the first testament, under the first covenant, under the old covenant, there were transgressions there. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ by means of death, that the death of Jesus was a, a, an, was a means of redeeming the transgressions that were under the first testament. So it is the death of Jesus that actually brings redemption for sins that were not committed in the New Testament, even sins that were committed under the First Testament. Because as verse 13 says, the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of Hepha, sprinkling the unclean, could not have made them totally right with God. All right? All he did was the flesh. Purify the flesh. Purify the flesh. But then the blood of Jesus is what is able to go deep down to the root cause of the problem, your conscience. So you can purge your conscience from dead works so that you can serve the living God. Verse 12 tells us that neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he had entered once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. So in verse 15 the point of the, the, the scripture is that Jesus Christ is the mediator of a New Testament, but the effect of his activity is transtestamental, if I may use that word. That is to say, in basic English, the death of Jesus, the atonement of Jesus is the basis upon which people like David, people like Moses, people like Aaron, their salvation is based on what Jesus did. It's not based on the blood of goats and bulls and of Hepha that they offered in those days. Are you there? Are you there? This verse 15, maybe we should read it from another translation. I know I'm out of time, but it's very important. Therefore, he's the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. Do you see that? A death has occurred that redeems them 
from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. What death is this death? It's the death of Jesus. So it is this death that redeems people from the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. This is why I used to say that if you want to understand the crux of Christianity, you need to answer the question, what is it that God could not do without Jesus coming into the world? That's how to understand Christianity. Anything that God was doing before Jesus came is not the main reason why Jesus came. So for instance, God was making people rich way before Jesus came into the world. People like Job, people like Abraham, people like Isaac, people like Jacob. Wealthy. People like Solomon. I mean, by some people's account, nobody has exceeded Solomon's wealth after Solomon. So, if prosperity, in quote, is a goal, Jesus didn't need to come. God was already doing a good job at it before Jesus came. If he's healing, God was healing the sick long before Jesus came. Even dead were being raised back to life long before Jesus came. In their numbers, Elijah, Elisha. Are you there? God was multiplying food before Jesus came. Elisha did. God was cleansing the lepers before Jesus came. Are you there? Are you there? So in order to understand the Christian distinctive, you need to answer that question. What is it that God could not do if Jesus never came? That's the distinctive of Christianity. That's the core. That's the unique primary objective of the Christian faith. So you realize when you read the scripture carefully, his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. All the sacrifices of the Old Testament pacified God for a season, but it never satisfied God. He could not satisfy the demands of divine justice. Because a goat cannot be appropriate payment for sins that were committed by a human. Are you there? The blood of bulls and goats cannot. 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 That's the language of scripture. Cannot. And there is no human being that would have been able to pay for their own sins so that they could be left off the hook. So even the people that God saved in the Old Testament, God saved them anticipating the death burial and resurrection of Jesus. So I used to say that God gave people salvation before Jesus, but he gave it to them on credit. It was the coming of Jesus that enabled God to balance the books so that the divine, the, the demands of divine justice were fully met and now the demands of mercy were also fully met. That could not happen until Jesus came. And so I can imagine how that Satan would have been harassing everybody. Hey, you say you are righteous. You say, you, how, how is it? How, even people like Moses, you know, you know how they got Moses? <laughs> they got Moses by divine fiat. Satan came to struggle. So the angel told Satan, I said, this one, just leave it to this, this one. There is no fight here. God is veto power that God uses. The Lord. <laughs> hey, but Moses did this. Say, oh, that one is you that understand. God has an executive order. By the decree of his majesty, the Lord rebuke you. He, he, the, the angel could not argue from legalities. But you know, at the cross of Jesus, all that score was settled. All the, how could you, that Satan might say to God, God will now point him to the cross. This was why I was able to do what I did. Paid in full. We insult God when we make Christianity any less 
than this. When you mainstream anything that God was doing before Jesus came in the spirit of the, the, the understanding of the word of God, when you mainstream anything that God could do without the coming of Jesus, you, you are giving Christianity a bad name. Hello? Hello? You are misnaming Christianity. You are, you are, you are misrepresenting Christianity. The main reason Jesus came into the world it's not so that you can be healed. It's not so that you can be rich. Are you there? It's not so that you can live long. I want to read the accounts of the men in Genesis. Huh? You've not read the account. That's why Met Methuselah has become a word that we use he became famous for how long he lived. And no matter what you do, you know, I've seen people in the name of Jesus and they, they read some Pauline things. I don't know where they are getting all the things from. And they come up and say, we are immortal, we are immortal. Oh, -ho. the ones that used to say it back in the day, we know where they were buried. And the ones that are saying it now, if Jesus starts to come, they will also be buried. And they will all be buried before they are 150. Are you with me? Are you with me? What, what, what Christianity is about, primarily, is not those things are icing on the cake. And no matter how much you love icing, you can't survive by it. Are you there? Yes. Even if you are weak and uh, you are suffering from low, whatever, blood pressure, and they say, hey, bring glucose. They say, we don't have glucose, say, but we just bake cakes. Okay, just pack the icing. We can't, you, you, you can't survive on icing. Entire ministries have been built around gospel irrelevance, gospel irrelevances. Entire ministries. And then we wonder sometimes why there's such a widespread of depression. We wonder sometimes why people cannot stand firm for Jesus. Why people cave in and crack under pressure and compromise at the slightest opportunity. It's because we have gone to the back row and we have picked something that is available but at the back row and we brought it to the front row. We mainstreamed it. And if you talk now, they'll say, but is it not in the Bible? Did God not say, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be held even as your... Well, that's if they read that far. And prosper and prosper. Did God not say? We are not saying God didn't say so. We are not saying God did this. But we are saying, what is the heart of the matter? What's the heart of the matter? Imagine, imagine if you were called a medical doctor. Supposed to be a medical doctor. Hmm? And then, let's say, 90% of your training, 90% of your training was calligraphy calligraphic writing hmm? because doctors historically have been known to write in tongues so now we now say 90% of the training for doctors should now be calligraphic writing they will not talk. You now say, what do you mean? Are you saying that a doctor's handwriting should not be legible? Do, do, you, do you know how dense this argument is? That's what it means. When you mainstream anything that should not be mainstreaming, when you mainstream anything that should not be mainstreamed, 
And then we talk and you say, are you now saying that? Because you're a Christian, you should be poor? No. But because you're a Christian, you can be poor. But we are not saying because you're a Christian, you should. But we are saying that because you're a Christian, you can. Because sometimes that will be the price of being a Christian. So that if being rich is the main thing, and Christianity takes the back row, on the day when it will mean being poor in order to retain being Christian, you will, re you will forgo being Christian and be rich. That's what it means. This is the import, this is the danger of majoring or minors. You may not know, you may not know on time because it may not be like, what's the difference? What, does it, what difference does it make? It does. It does make a difference. You will now see people who are saying now that the reason they are no more following God is because God disappointed them. Huh? That God disappointed them. They are classmates that don't know God, that don't serve God. They all got married before they were 26. And they are 32. And the last time anybody said, I like you, the person was not even a serious Christian. And it was four years ago. So what's the point? Hello? Well, the point of Christianity is not marriage. That's not the main point. You can be a Christian and never get married. You will still be a Christian. The major reason Jesus came into the world is not so that you will get a wife. That's not the main reason he came. So when you predicate your commitment to Jesus on his uh, provision, his spousal provision, you see, you see that something is wrong. Then when we say this, you are not saying, so are you not saying that because I'm a Christian, I, I should not marry on time? No. But we are saying that because you are a Christian, you may not marry on time. Whatever on time means, because I don't know what it means. But whatever time you think is the on time, because you are a Christian, you may not marry at that time. Because marrying at that time is not the primary objective of God in your life. If you are still here, say amen. amen. There is a knowledge of God. There is a knowing of God. There is a peace. There is a love. There is a joy. There is a communion. There is a fellowship that you need to enter into when you know God and his love in the person of Christ Jesus that everything else, like Paul said, will be altogether less than nothing that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering that I may be made conformable unto his death if by any means. And this man is saying that everything that was gained to me I now count them lost for the what? For the surpassing excellence of the knowledge of my God. So you realize that usually, 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 you, you, there is a certain level of what's the word? Of relinquishment to relinquish. There's a certain level of submission if you like. There's a certain level of letting go. There's a certain level of deliberate abandonment. Like you need to abandon your life in the hands of God. I don't know how else to say it. Because you know that you are covered by the love of God. Listen to me. God loves you more than words can tell. And because God loves you, God is pursuing in your life the highest ideal that are possible. God is pursuing the highest possible ideal that are motivated by love. And that journey can take you through very unexpected and unpleasant places, naturally speaking. 
But if you want to find out your disposition at the end of it all, read the book of Revelation and look at the songs of saints when they eventually gather around this throne. You will remember that nobody had a regret. Have you realized? Have you read all those songs in Revelation? Nobody had a regret. Nobody had a complaint. Because like the old songwriter said, we shall understand it better by and by. I need to pray in the Holy Ghost for a few seconds. I want, I want you to, if it's possible, to fall in love afresh with God. Without conditions. I know that I don't know. I know that I don't know. And I hope you know. But I know in whom I have believed. There are many details of life that I don't get, that I don't understand. But where it matters, where it matters, my heart has found a resting place. It's not in device, it's not in creed. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Help my heart, galvanize my heart. Deliver me. Deliver me from the fickleness of my days. Deliver me from the pressure, the pressure, the pressure of the times. Deliver me from the idiosyncrasies of my days. For the things that are highly esteemed among men, they are an abomination before the Lord. Help my value system. Help my mind. Help my orientation. Circumcise my heart. Incline my heart to love you. Incline my heart. Incline my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Take it and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. <laughs> Nothing in this world satisfy. Oh, Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. I don't know about all the people, but your presence is heaven to me. that you will win our hearts win our hearts away from carnal attractions, affections the blink blinks of this world the things that dazzle the things that entrap the things that shine but they shine 
with ephemerality. The things fading, passing, fickle, unstable, but yet they dazzle. Win our hearts, win our hearts, win our hearts from the temporal, win our hearts for the things that are seen are temporal, the things that are not seen are eternal. Because of God that our hearts will find rest in you. Find rest in you. Find rest in you. May we be assured of your love, your faithfulness, your commitment beyond anything that the world can throw at us that will stand with you convinced and in full assurance of your love and your commitment that you are light and in you there's no darkness at all. Therefore, you said, because I live, you sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. Thou might be so convinced of your love and your care and your commitment and your mercy towards us and the eagerness with which you dispose, you are disposed to displaying and to manifesting these to us. That it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at us, that we'll be able to say, like that lady, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Help us to enter into that realm, into that place of unwavering commitment and love and devotion to you and with you. Songwriter says, from his love, no power on earth can severe. May that be our experience, that we are captured in your love, captured by your love, that the passing things of this world will be too ephemeral in our reckoning to determine our allegiance. Our hearts are fixed. We love you from now till the end of time. Because you have loved us much more than we could ever understand and than we could ever reciprocate. Even so, Jesus, I ask that we help our heart infuse in us a fresh appreciation for your person and for everything that you have done to bring us into a relationship with yourself. In Jesus' mighty name. Did you say amen? amen. Did you say amen? amen? All right. So, I was going to read Exodus chapter 24. Is it? Exodus chapter 24. I was trying to establish a connection between I was trying to establish a connection between the covenant of uh, Abraham and then the thing that God did with Moses that came 430 years later. And then I wanted to show you the window of blood. How that the Bible says that Jesus, through the blood of the eternal covenant, is able to purge our conscience from dead work so that we can serve the living God. Now, in the 16th verse, the 15th verse of that uh, passage we're reading in Hebrews chapter 9, the Bible says, For this cause is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of, the, of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. 
All right? So, it is that um, bloody ceremony that I'm trying to call your attention to. And in Exodus, I think it's chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24, so that we can wrap this up. From verse 1. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come nigh the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord had said will we do. Verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builded an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant Follow this. He took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. Follow the sequence. Verse 7. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And the people said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. Obedient And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord God has made with you concerning all these words. Did you see that? It is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. So, when you go back to, um, you can, you can, you can, I wish there was a way to help you to put these two passages side by side in your mind. The passage we read in Hebrews chapter 9, so give me your attention, I'm going to uh, uh, close up with these blood contemplations. Now, the passage we read in Hebrews chapter 9, it talked to us about the fact that a testament is not of effect until after the death of the testator. You remember that? You remember that? And now went on to say that even the first testament was not actualized, all right? Let, let's look at it. The testament, okay, otherwise of no strength at all while the testator lives. So the testator... The, if the testator is alive, the testament is of no effect. Testament in this context, a very easy way for you to understand it would be what? A will. A will. A will is of no effect as long as the owner is alive. It is the death of the owner of the will that triggers the will, isn't it? I'm sure you know enough to know that. So that's the whole idea here. So the, testa the testament is of no effect while the testator is alive. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Okay, read on. Uh huh. Verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. So the first testament is a testament in context under Moses. That was why I took you back to Exodus chapter 24. When Moses was bringing the people of God into covenant with God on account of the law, the words that God had given by commandment, you remember the sequence we read in, in chapter 24, which is part of what is as, uh, established here. How did we get here? Now, 
So Moses, according to uh, this, this writer, he said, For when Moses had spoken every precept unto the people according to the law, what did he do? He took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. I need you to notice a sequence here because this is very important for your understanding of testaments. Are you there? And it will help us to answer an important question that sometimes plagues believers. And there are people who know how to smooth talk and they appear logical when they say the things they say. But look at scripture on its own terms. So the Bible is very clear here that the testament in, 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 in Hebrews 9 that I was reading, the Bible says, verse 18, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law. So they speak in the delivery of the content of the law happened. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood. So, in sequence, the delivery of the content precedes the application of blood. That's what the Bible says. And that's what your common experience tells you. That's what is implied by no testament is of effect until the death of the testator. For while the testator leaves, the testament is of no effect. And that is to say that the testament is triggered, is activated by the death of the testator. This is why sometimes when people know that somebody has left them a huge resource in their will, they try to find ways to kill the person because they know that that will be a way to trigger the will as long as the man is alive. Even though 10 million of this man's estate belongs to them, they know they can't have it while the man is alive. But once the man dies, ah, it is the death of the man that triggers and activates the will. That's what Moses is saying here. And now says that even the first testament in symbol, it had to be, it had to be done. That Moses came and read the precept unto all the people according to the law. And then he took the blood of calves. When you follow the passage that we read where it happened, that is being read, that is being re referenced here, in Exodus chapter 24, the Bible now says in verse 6, there about, verse 6. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Okay, let's go on. And he took the book of the covenant. Do you see that? So he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of all the people and said, oh, and in the audience of the people, and they said, the people now said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. So that means that the part of God, the position of God was communicated to the people, and then the people responded. So yes, we agree. When this happened, okay, and Moses took the blood. Do you see that? Do you see that? It was after the terms of the covenant had been communicated to the people that Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Because you cannot, hello, hello. Okay, let me put it this way. The New Testament, the New Testament, because it said, even the Old Testament, even the first, that is to tell you that it is the norm everywhere, including even the First Testament, and this is what you are seeing here, that it was not ratified without blood. But the sequence now is what I'm trying to call your attention to. And the import is this. It means that the New Testament also was triggered by blood. Whose blood would that be? I can't hear you. Are you scared? Whose blood is it? 
Jesus. Okay, if the New Testament was triggered by the blood of Jesus, it means that the Testament must have been present before the blood. Nobody writes their will after they die. Everywhere you sit in scripture, that's what you just read. Moses had to read out unto the people the words of the covenant. Then the people heard it and they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. It was then that Moses now took blood to apply to the people. So you see, sometimes people tell you that if you want to understand the New Testament, you should start your reading from the Pauline epistles. Have you heard that before? And they say, because, that they, because then they will now quote for you Hebrews. Isn't it? They will quote for you Hebrews, how that um, uh, a testament is of force after men are dead. Um, where is that their quotation? Okay, yes. So, for a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no, for, of no strength at all while the testator lives. So, they now say, hey, so it means if you want to understand the New Testament, you should go to the things that happened after Jesus died. And I'm like, no. No. And if you follow the labor that I just labored, you'd have seen why that position is not true. The testament precedes the death of the testator. The, the testament does not succeed it. The testament does not come after the death. It's just that it is the death that triggers it. But the testament has, has to be prepared, written. It's like a will. Nobody plans to write their will after they are dead. But even though the will is written while they are alive, it is their dying that makes the will to come into effect. So, it would mean that for us to understand the New Testament, are you there? Hmm. When Jesus Christ commemorated or initiated, inaugurated what we now commemorate as the Lord's Supper, you know what he said? He said, this cup is the blood of the New Testament. This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. Hmm. So Jesus Christ is indicating that his blood is the seal of the New Testament. In order, therefore, to understand the Testament, you cannot be said to be wrong if you are looking at things that happened before the blood. So when they have now said, therefore, to you that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even Acts of the Apostle, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, particularly, that is historic, it's not, you know, Jesus is still Judaism. That is Judaism. That Christianity is from the resurrection of Jesus going forward. That's where you, that's where you need to be reading if you need to understand New Testament. And I said, how? If Pauline, if the Pauline is where the New Testament material begins, what, where is it sealed? Where is the blood that activates it? Because Jesus died before the Pauline. So the thing that was triggered by the blood of Jesus, Paul may have expounded on it. But you cannot say we can't understand it by reading the things that happened before the blood. In fact, when Jesus was about to die, no, when Jesus was about to go to heaven, in, in Matthew chapter 28, he told his disciples in the commission he gave to them, he told them that they should go and teach all nations everything whatsoever he had commanded them. So in, in Jesus' commission to his apostles to go into 
post-resurrection ministry, Jesus was saying that his teachings in his lifetime on earth were appropriate and accurate and legitimate material for the discipling of the nations. If you are still here, say amen. In fact, do, do you understand the absurdity of saying that the gospel is not to be found in the gospels? You know we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel according to St. Matthew. The gospel according to St. Luke. Then somebody now came and said, if you want to understand the gospels, the gospel, don't look at the gospels. Constipation is a terrible thing. <laughs> ah, constipation. Let's, let's just blame it on constipation. Because if you are not constipated, you can wake up in the morning and start telling people that they cannot find the gospel in the gospels. There's a reason why the church historically called those books the gospels. Because when Jesus died, the death of Jesus was now what triggers or activates the covenant, the testament. So the testament must have been given. That's what happens every single time. Moses read out the precept unto the people. When the people accepted it, then blood was applied. So the ministry of Jesus is the explication of the gospel. And then the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was now how it was triggered. The testament is of force after the death of the testator. It does not say the testament is written after the death of the testator. It does that while the testator is alive, the testament is of no effect. It's your will. You've written the will. It is after you die that the lawyers will come and then you know, when I say, okay, we attend to your will. I said all that because as you go along, you are going to be hearing people that we discountenance the position of many things that are said in the Gospels and their basis will be that it happened before the cross. They said that was before the cross. That was before the cross. If you want to understand the Gospel, go into the epistles, especially the Pauline epistles, because the gospel began after the resurrection of Jesus. I don't have the time to run that class for you today. But the line, historically, the line that divides the Old Testament from the New Testament, hello, testament-wise, the testament was activated by the blood, of Jesus, but the explication that means the reading out of the testament it began with the ministry of Jesus. That was why John the Baptist kept telling the people, The time is at hand. The, he said, Repent, the time is at hand, the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus came, the Bible did say to us that. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent, they take it by force. I, I know you use it for spiritual warfare and all of those things, but it is spiritual warfare of another sort in reality. And I'm not saying you shouldn't use it for the things you use it. But you still, at least you need to understand the native context of the text and then you can innovate at least, if you want to innovate. At least know, like I said yesterday, know the rule so that you know how to break it. When the Bible said those things that were said, you are looking at Luke, you are looking at uh, Matthew, all right, Matthew 11, or you are looking at Luke, Luke what, 16? There about. Okay, yes. From the days of John the Baptist even until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Why? Verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. That's why. John was the last of them. 
from the days of John till now. The reason is because, you remember that, when John baptized Jesus, after the baptism of Jesus, the ministry of John just started going down like that until he faded. Because he must increase, I must decrease. John had to come before Jesus for this exact reason. So John did ministry as a forerunner for the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus came, it was almost as if John, that baptismal service was almost like a handover service. And from that moment, from that moment, reality arrived on the scene of human history. That was why there was so much violence. That from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Why? Because all the prophets and the law, they prophesied until John. What does that mean? It means that all the prophets and the law, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Hmm. The prophets and the law kept saying, Salvation will come, salvation will come, salvation will come, salvation will come. Until John. When John came, John answered, Behold. That means salvation has arrived. John's prophetic ministry began as if he was prophesying things to come, and then he transitioned into prophesying things that have come. It is because the things that the law and the prophets were pointing to, when they were saying, he will come, he will come, there was no violence, there was no war to be fought. When it was true that he has finally arrived, ah, that was when the violence broke out. The reason now is because the thing that was being anticipated has now finally become a reality. Hello? When they were saying he will come, he will come, sit and we say, we are here, let's see how he will come. He won't come, we are here. We are here. And Satan tried. Give him some credit. He tried. Didn't he try? He tried. He tried to make sure that he did not come. It was part of the reason why they killed the children from two years and below. It was the effort to make sure that he did not arrive. So as at the time the prophecy was he will come, he will come. Satan didn't take anybody seriously. He said, well, we see how he will come. But when, contrary to all of his scheme, he truly arrived. What? So the thing that was an anticipation, that was an expectation, is now a reality. And the Bible is saying to us that the, the, the line that separates that season from this season is John the Baptist. So John is the one that straddles, if you like, the prophetic with regards to the messianic promises that God had made. When God said, he will come. He will come. A scepter. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Huh? Oh, um, Bethlehem, you are not the least. Even though you are small, out of you will arise the governor. Eh, all of it is future talk. When John came, John said, there is one coming after me. Who is preferred before me? He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. There is one coming after me. After me. After me. And then one day, John woke up. And pointed at him and said, Behold, behold, what? He's arrived. Yes. That was when it began. And in case you doubt me, the same Matthew 11, all right? Matthew 11, the same Matthew 11, verse, verses 1, verses 2. Matthew 11. I said 1 and 2. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities, all right? Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, this is Matthew 11, John is already in jail. He sent two of his disciples, let's read on, and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another, okay? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again. Those things which you do hear and see. What are the things? The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have what? The what? The what? The gospel preached to them. 
This is Matthew 11. And Jesus is saying, the people here, what they are hearing is the gospel. Huh? Then 2,000 years later, Damina now comes and say, if you want to understand the gospel, Forget about the Gospels. Then Jesus said, what I am doing is the Gospel. What I'm preaching is the Gospel. And Damina said, it's not the Gospel. Where, where, where do people used to buy this kind of demonic boldness from? Where do they buy it? In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus came into the temple, into the synagogue, and they gave him the book of Isaiah, you remember? He found a place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach what? The what? The gospel. Uh -uh. Jesus said, God anointed me to preach the gospel. Okay, let's say that's just announcement. Then later on, while he was doing ministry, on the field of ministry, they came and met him. He said, what I'm doing here is, I am preaching the gospel. Haba Malam. It is the explication of the covenant, the testament. It has to be read out. It has to be written. It has to be given before blood is applied to activate it. The blood is like the way you sign. You append your signature to a will by activation. So it, it's almost as if to say, Jesus now, now took a blank sheet and signed it. And say, you people can write the will. Hello. It's like a wealthy man whose will was just signature at the end. Then you have 17 plain sheets. Now say, when I die, my children, people can sit down and write it. You see how absurd it is. Huh? But you know that when the man dies, the lawyer can now come and read. And sometimes even you sat there as his first boy, you may not understand. They will talk about a manager, they say administrator. They say, he say, which one is manager? Which one is administrator? What is estate? Because when you hear estate, you now say, ah, I didn't know my father had an estate. No. You see? You see? So the lawyer will, even though the will has been written, it's possible that you may need help to grasp the import of the things that are written in there. But that is not the same as saying it was a blank sheet. Jesus said he came to preach the gospel. Jesus, when they met him on the field, said the poor have the gospel preached to them. It's too late in the 20th century or 21st century to now come along to redefine, to reinvent history. Why? Because you don't like the Lord's Prayer. Right? So how can you say forgive us our sins as you forgive those that sinned against us? That God does not forgive you as you forgive others. That God forgives you so that you can forgive others. And you see, nonsense is nonsense, irrespective of who says it. And this thing I just repeated to you is nonsense. The teachings of Jesus, they constitute New Testament teachings. Because it was the gospel. You know how John chapter 1 says it? The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by whom? By Jesus. In fact, if Jesus Christ was the continuation of the law, why did they kill him? The people that killed him, they killed him in the, name of, in the name of the law. It was to defend the mosaic system that they killed Jesus. The people that killed Jesus, 
believed that they were on the side of Moses. And it was to defend and preserve the purity of Judaism that they killed Jesus. Then you now wake up and say, Jesus and Ju that, that was Judaism. That day. So they will say that the New Testament, some will say the New Testament is from the resurrection. Others will say it's from the day of Pentecost. Right? But if you read your Bible, and I don't have time now to do all of that for you, the apostles' understanding is John the Baptist. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. When they were going to find a replacement for Judas that had gone the way of perdition, do you remember the way that it was stated? Hello? And among these that have accompanied with us. Acts chapter 1. This people, your system, it, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. I finished reading this verse. So, For he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and, his, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto the dwellers of Jerusalem in so much that the field was called in their proper tongue, Akaldema, that is to say the field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us was the marker. Beginning from what? The baptism of John. Unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. It's beginning from what? The baptism of John. In the house of Cornelius, right? If I remember well, in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Let's see. Acts chapter 10. Okay? Okay? Okay, so, hmm, let's see verse 40. Forty. All right, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, uh-huh, not to all people but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which is ordained of God to be judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive the remission of sins. Okay, let's read on. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And what happened? Okay, sorry. The verse I'm looking for is from verse 35. No, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that fears him and walks righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus. I'm trying to show you that John the Baptist is the marker. Is a line that separates historically the Old Testament from the New. Are you there? Final scripture and then we pray. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by whom? By the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. 
So this great salvation at the first was spoken by whom? The Lord. Who is the Lord here? Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ was the one that first spoke, that began to speak of this great salvation. And then the people that heard Jesus now confirmed it unto us. Which is to say, therefore, that the teachings of the apostles of Jesus is not at variance with the teachings of Jesus. Because it is a gospel. But my point here is, Jesus was the one that began to preach it. And then the thing Jesus began to preach was confirmed to us by the people that heard him. Because that time Jesus was preaching, you were not there. So the people that are preaching it to us, the writer is speaking in context, the people that heard him, they are the ones now confirming it to us. But it did not begin with them. The gospel of salvation did not have its origin in the apostles. It began with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That was the exact thing that he died to what? To activate. The reason I've done what I have done last night and this morning is because is, I told you yesterday that we're going to do a refresher this weekend, isn't it? It's a refresher because it is very possible that we keep assuming that we all know these things, we all know these things. But like I said yesterday, there's a lot of transition that happens here. People come, people go, people come, people go. And a generation might arise that is not aware of the elements of the things that are most surely believed among us. And we feel that this weekend, which is the immediate week, the, our meeting after the weekend of Easter, will be a good time to put back on the scene, to put back again on the table for us to know the things that are most surely believed among us so that your heart may be established in this present truth, that you will have confidence when you do scriptures, that you will know that, you know, because there are people that it's as if their only objective in life is to derail believers. So they have a lot of time on their hands and they find different creative ways to say the same useless things. Hey, you know, whatever. Your sin does not matter. And the Old Testament, and then, they, you know, they, they find all kinds of ways to try to discredit, as it were, the Old Testament, uh, uh, the New Testament teachings of Jesus because they don't like it. And when you push them, you realize that that's actually what the issue is. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. If you approach scripture with an agenda, you will always be wrong. Ten out of ten times, you will be wrong. If you have an agenda that you bring to the script, you will be wrong. Ten out of ten times. And a close relative of that is that if you have an agenda, it's not hard to find passages that you can tweak to help you say the thing that you want to say. So when people pitch the apostles against Jesus, it's a very foolish thing to do. Say, Jesus, say, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then uh, Paul said, for God had forgiven us for Christ's sake. And that God, the Bible now says we should forgive others because we have been forgiven. So it is not we should forgive so that we can be forgiven. But that Paul actually said we should forgive because we have been forgiven. The, the thing that a faithful Christian will do will be to say, it looks like there's a contradiction between this and this. So in what way are these two things not contradictory? Because both of them belong in the same milieu. And that milieu is called the gospel. That's what a faithful Christian will do. It's not to say, let's cancel this one, let's hold this one. Because just as some people will want to cancel Jesus and, in quote, and, think what, and take what they think they understand Paul to be saying, other people will, think, will want to cancel Paul. They'll say, if Jesus says something and Paul says a different thing, who will you rather believe? Who will you rather believe? 
That's why you have people like Suleiman saying the nonsense they are saying. His laziness. That's the most benign, huh? the most benign impetus that I can attribute to such a move is laziness. But many times things are more sinister than that. The teachings of Paul cannot lead you into error. Because Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So maybe I will take time because this evening is basically going to be for prayers. So maybe I'll take time in the days to come to resolve some of these things for you. Why it looks as if sometimes there's apparent contradiction between some of the statements of the apostles and the things that Jesus taught. Things like maybe forgiveness of sins. Even things like salvation. Because there's a tendency for you to think that Jesus Christ taught salvation by works, but it's not true. All of the salvific parables of Jesus, the cross is very evident in them. But if you do not situate them in the context of the Jewish audience that he was speaking to, you may miss the cross. So people attribute, some people have come to attribute innovations to Paul, that Paul innovated and distorted the message of Jesus and founded something. And because he was so vocal and expressive, he has literally hijacked Christianity in a way that is a derailment from what Jesus sought to establish. And then other people will come up and say, Jesus Christ was actually part of the Old Testament. So they will put Paul on the stage. Other people will throw Paul away and put Jesus on the stage. And I need you to know that in that regard, as far as this thing is concerned, both the Damina and the Suleiman camp are wrong. You can quote me on this one. There is harmony between the epistles and the gospels. Because the same God inspired both. And the same God was working through both. And what God has joined together. Let neither Damina nor Suleiman put asunder. Hallelujah. You know, this one is our own stage. They can't disinvite me from here. <laughs> See, you said this, you will not come back here. We'll be here on Tuesday. We'll probably be here in the evening. <laughs> we'll be back here on Tuesday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, you, you, I want you to be, hello, okay, just before I pray for you, the things I have said this morning, was there rema inside? Is it not obvious? Did I rheumatize? No, I'm asking a simple question. Did I rheumatize? The things we, I, is it not the plain meaning of the passages? There's nothing deep in what I have said. If I simply say, look at this problem, look at this problem, and then I only pointed you at the passages and I say you should read them, you will arrive at the conclusion I just gave you. Because Hebrews 9 is so detailed and said it in so many different ways that while the testator is alive, the testament is not of effect. Huh? While he's alive. That the testament comes into effect after the death of the testator. It's clear. Then he goes on to give us the example of how it happened even in the first testament. And in the sequence, Moses read it out, read it out, read it out before applying blood. Then we went to Exodus and we saw that Moses read it out after writing it in a book and then read it out. The people made their own commitment and they said, we will do, we will be obedient. Then Moses applied blood. He, this is what the passage says. It's not my interpretation. Then Jesus said, God anointed me to preach the gospel. Jesus said to the disciples of John, the gospel is being preached to the poor. Are you there? 
The Hebrew said, this salvation at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. So I'm not the one who is trying to interpret scripture to make it say that Jesus preached the gospel. It, it is from the lips of Jesus. That's what I mean by, there's no rhema here. So if anybody tells you that you need to go to the epistles to understand the gospel, the person is wrong. And I'm saying it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, whether, you, you know, you can be hotter than Sokoto. If you are wrong, you are wrong. I don't know what degrees it is in Sokoto today. This morning just was like 28. So I don't care the degrees that is before your name, whether it's in Celsius or Fahrenheit. Or if they gave it to you from a seminary. Nonsense is nonsense, irrespective of who is saying it. And then if you now wake up, if you wake up to now say, hey, Paul, 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 Paul said this one, Paul is aberrant, you know, people can use Paul and if you follow Paul. So God told you, it, it wasn't God. It, God didn't tell you to forget about the teachings of Paul. It was not God. Whoever you heard was not God. And I don't need to be there. It wasn't God you heard. The Bible said, these things were spoken by the Lord and it was confirmed to us by them that heard him. Are you with me? And when Paul came, the people that heard Jesus, Paul went and met them and when they considered what Paul was doing, they gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. And they said, the labor is vast, so let's distribute the field. You go to the Gentiles, we go to the Jews. But the gospel, the message is the same. Those were the people that walked with Jesus, they ate with Jesus, they slept with Jesus. So which God told you to forget about Paul? You didn't hear God. Let God be true. And let all men, if they like, let them be liars. We can do nothing against the truth. So what a reasonable person will do if you see apparent contradiction is to put in the hard work to find out the harmony that may not be apparent but is present because it is there. That's what, that's what a faithful Christian will do. You will not pitch one against the other. Because God is not, come on, God is not bipolar. God will not write something on Tuesday and then write a contrary, contrary thing on Friday. God will not say something in Peter and say the opposite in Paul. Come on. Holy men spoke as they were moved, as they were carried along by the Spirit of God. All scripture is given by inspiration. The same God breathed out the Pauline epistles. The same God breathed out the Petrine epistles, the Johannine corpus. The same God breathed out the gospels. All scripture is given by inspiration. Have you been blessed this morning? All right, bow your heads. I want you to talk to God in a few moments. I want you to talk to Jesus. The blood by which the covenant in which we stand was ratified is not the blood of bulls and of goats and of heifer. Better promises were sealed by the blood of the eternal covenant. And because every testament is of no effect until the death of the testator, Jesus had to die to seal this testament so that you can have a strong consolation that have fled to take refuge in the gospel that we now have as a hope 
that is like an anchor that reaches deep into the holy place where Jesus has for us entered. I, my goal this morning is just to bring you some confidence, some assurance so that you can have, you can be established in the faith a little bit more. That you can understand the immovability, the absolute, the absolute reliability of the faith that you now profess. When the songwriter says, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Is that solidness of the ground that I've been trying to explicate? Maybe you want to say thank you to Jesus. Jesus Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to appreciate God for how much God has done so that we can have confidence. It feels good to know that I'm not on probation. There's, I'm not on probation. You know, sometimes when you get a job, they place you on a six-month probation. So let's see how you go. After six months, if you do well, then we can confirm your appointment. I'm not on probation. I've been accepted. And look at how much God did. Just so that I can be firmly, firmly rooted in the love that he has lavishly shown to me. The blood of his son Jesus ratifies the covenant by which I have been accepted. No man can disannul it. No man. I am safe because God himself is the one who holds me. And he holds me in the hollow of his hands. I just want you to express gratitude. Gratitude gratitude to the one who loves us like this I don't know how much you will go to impress and to, to affirm your love to a person but look at how much God went just to say to you I love you just to say to you I love you thank you Jesus and every time I contemplate these things, there's a buoyancy in my spirit. Ah! The creator of the ends of the earth has taken particular knowledge of me, insignificant in myself as I am, so much that he did all of this for me. Come on. Come on. Come on. No one that Theophilus will say, Satan, do your worst. Satan, bring your best. Just be rest assured that I have been taken by the Lord. I feel, I feel the sentiment. 
I feel it. I've been taken by the Lord. Snatched. Yanked away. From darkness. And brought into light. Established. On the foundations of the apostles and the prophet. Christ Jesus himself. Being the chief cornerstone. Paul talks about the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Gave himself for me. I want you to appreciate him this morning. We are contemplating the atonement and salvation in the spirit of Easter. That's what we are doing. And I don't know any other posture with which to approach these matters than gratitude. And gratitude. Thank you will never be enough. But what else can we say? What else can we say? Gratitude. Lord, we bring our gratitude to you. Thank you, Jesus. Eso me fale te so la baja Mo fi te skeboro ti taili ba no ko felati na skevrate na kobi na te la mama Me vede zi e te na tami na tu se bara tombe le de gebo boyo tota Miki te na skiboro ta skavate so penate O kini na tua susai di deye kobe i tanama bonata so me lama Jesus Jesus you know sometimes it's things like this that make you feel so high in the spirit so buoyant makes you feel so established indestructible unmovable Now I can believe when God gave the instruction and to say, touch not man anointed, I can believe it. A God that lost me like this, what else will he not do? This God that did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not with him give us all things? Finally today, I want you to cast all your cares on him. I want you to lay all your burdens at his feet. He loves you. He loves you. He, he, he's done enough to establish to you that he loves you. You can trust God with your life. And you can trust him with your future. You can trust him with your troubles. You can trust him with your pain. You can trust God with your complexities, perplexities. You can trust God with the dilemmas of your life. You can trust God with the unanswered questions of your life. A God that has done what this God has done can be trusted. And I want to encourage you today to trust Him. Cast your burdens, cast your cares upon Him. Because He cares for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.
off my head To stand to your feet as we say the last time. For God, oh Lord, you are a shield for me. You are my glory, my glory, and the lifter of my hands. You are my glory. My glory, you're the lifter up of my, of my head. head. Oh, my glory, glory, my glory, you're the lifter up of my One more time. Head. Yes, you are my glory, my glory. for great things you have done for us. Thank you. Thank you. For giving to us your son. Thank you for leaving your Holy Spirit until your work on earth is done. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We ask, oh God, that we never lose our wonder, that we never lose our gratitude, that would we'll never lose our appreciation for you and for so much that you have done for us. I ask therefore that everyone who is of faint of heart, everyone that is giving in to fear, to pressure, to depression, I ask that there be a new affection in each of our hearts and with it a new joy, a new confidence, a new boldness in the assurance and in the certainty of the love of this God that loved us so much as to give his very life for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Help us to walk worthy. Help our lives, that our lives practically will be an ongoing expression of our gratitude to you. A wise man said, because he died for me, I will live all my life for him. Lord, may that be the story of each of our lives. That our lives will be practical reflections of the gratitude that is within our hearts. That one loved us enough to snatch us from the very claws of hell and of death. And that to the one that we owe our lives, to him we live our lives. May that be where this all ends. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Do you have a better amen than that? <laughs>